Eso lo vamos a poner. Maybe I can say that as well. Welcome to the first plenary session. Let me introduce Professor Oja Tadeli. I take a very brief review of your bio. It's called Engineering Legends. And it says, I am on the wall in engineering educators, Oja Tadeli, University renowned for its many leading edge and pioneering contributions to a multitude of different engineering and scientific disciplines. As his words, I break the boundaries of disciplines and he presents it may defend as inventing the future. Ohad was born in an Iranian town on the southern shores of the Caspian Sea with a physician father and his mother was from Safavi dynasty, one of the founders of Sufism. If I am right. He received his Bachelor degree and master degree at the Universidad of Tehran in Delhi. He moved to Stanford where he got his PhD in 1976. Then Ohad Adeli moved to Nawazerstan University and then went back to Tehran again. And then he moved again to the United States, to Utah, then to the uh, Ohio State University where he is uh, in this university now. He's professor of the Department of Aerospace Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, Biomedical Informatics, Electrical Computer Engineering, Neurological Surgery, and Neuroscience. So, as you can conclude, very disciplinar, multidisciplinary work. And he's also the editorial chief of Computer Aided Civil and Infrastructure Engineering, Integrated Computer Aided Engineering, and the journal, International Journal of Neural Systems. That is the second journal in computer science with an impact factor of 6.5, something like, like this. So for me, it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Professor Ojata Professor. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. 
Uh, I'm gonna say that uh, this is actually my first, fourth uh, trip to Spain and fourth uh, kilometer in Spain. So uh, Spain is one of my favorite countries, and I keep coming back here. So and I'm sure this will be my last trip. Uh, here you see the title. And I've been working in this area for the last 14 years. I want to give you a summary of the last 14 years rather than talking about one or two particular topics. But first, uh, uh, I want to give credit to the person who inspired me to do this research. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me? Oh, then I will say here. Sorry. Can you hear me better now? Okay, very good. I'm sorry. <coughs> I was going to tell you here, uh, I want to give credit to the person who inspired me to do this research, and that person is a physician, Nahi Chakme, who happens to be my wife. So, you know, some 14, 15 years ago, she used to tell me at dinner how devastating Alzheimer's disease is, and, you know, they couldn't do anything, they couldn't help with the Alzheimer's patients, and then I got interested into looking at their brain of the Alzheimer patients, brain I mean uh, the brain waves. So I asked her whether I could look at the, the brain waves of some of the Alzheimer patients, and one thing I learned that uh, uh, neurologists don't order EEG or electroencephalogram for Alzheimer patients because they can't see anything. They can't see anything. So then I said, all right, uh, what kind of uh, disease do you order EEG? Uh, she said epilepsy. So I got into epilepsy first. So my dream research was to develop a method for early onset diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's disease. But I had to start working in the area of uh, epilepsy. If you pay attention, you will see also two other Adeli there, and they happen to be my two children, they're also neurologists. So brain is a family affair in my family. So we started doing research on epilepsy, <clears throat> and uh, you can see that this is a transdisciplinary research, and finding the right PhD student is a little challenging. That PhD student has to know several different fields, and uh, the field is actually called computational neuroscience or neuroengineering. And the final output of this research is a new algorithm. We developed a new algorithm. So here you see a story from a local paper. The story in 2007, there was an accident. And do I have a pointer here somewhere? Do I have a pointer? Okay. While we're trying to get a pointer here, I want to point to that uh, bottom right corner there. So there was an accident, and I think three people died. Why? Because uh, the man had a seizure while driving. You know, seizure is a common acute disorder, not very famous as much as, you know, heart disease or Alzheimer's disease is quite common. And there are different kinds of epilepsies uh, in some kinds, and you don't have seizure often. You have it once every year. So you have a normal life, and once every uh, year you have a seizure, and if you're driving, then you can see them with a double access. So the goal of this research is to detect the uh, seizure and both detect seizure and also diagnose epilepsy automatically. And if we can do that, we can use the same technology to predict seizures. So we can implant a micro device in the brain of the patient. And uh, so by predicting seizures, then we can inject medicine and prevent seizures. So that's a goal of this research. So <clears throat> as I said, epilepsy is a common disorder, and one person of the population has epilepsy, and uh, there are different kinds of epilepsies, classified as generalized seizure and uh, partial or focal seizure, and they are categorized on the basis of the focal region, and uh, characterized by symptom rather than cause. Causes are not really known. Thank you so much. You got a point of point. So this works. So this is an engineer view. You know, I'm an engineer by training, but a lot of my research are actually in neuroscience and neurology. I'm also a professor of neurology. A professor of neurology who is not a physician. 
So this is an engineer's perspective on the problem. So you know seizure versus coma. So you can see that uh, both of them are results of imbalance. In the case of seizure, you have too much excitation, and uh, in the case of coma, you have too much inhibition. So uh, here. You see that loss of excitatory synapses uh, can uh, too much, too much of them can uh, create uh, and seizure and inhibition uh, control tightly the excitation. So the disruption of the balance leads to runaway excitation, and you have uh, that can spread to other parts of the brain. So we have uh, seizure. So what is the current practice? The current practice. Uh, a neurologist, a neurologist or an epileptologist. Epileptologist is a, neuro is a neurologist who has had additional training, one or two years of training, uh, just epilepsy. So he only focuses on epilepsy. Actually, one of my children is an epileptologist. So that's all since he sees, sees all day he sees epileptologist. And he sits in front of a monitor, of course, monitor, there's a monitor in the hospital or at his home on a laptop computer and read EEGs. So, and this is a very, 20 hours per week, he reads EEG. It can be kind of a, you know, tiring, boring uh, situation. I also ask him, the last one is a quote from him. The abnormality yield of a standard 30 minute EEG is only 30 to 50%. So if the epileptologist cannot see anything, then he has to order a, Overnight is there, the patient has to go to the hospital, let's see overnight and have a 24 hour or 48 hour recording. So, so the epileptologist can see. And the whole thing is done by observation, by using your naked eyes. Epileptologist uses his own naked eyes to uh, make a detection of epilepsy or a diagnosis of epilepsy. Sorry, let's move on now to the next one. Okay, we started, as I said, I want to give a little history how we started. We started like 13 years ago, and the first thing we looked was the absence seizure. Absence seizure, you can see some patients on the right happen posting in kids, and it's something that the neurologists can make the diagnosis very easy. So the first thing we did, we said we duplicated what a neurologist could do. And that paper was published in 2003. It has been now cited like 600 times. So actually, that paper virtually started this field, this field of automated EEG based on the uh, diagnosis of various neurological disorders. So next, we said, okay, I want to look at a kind of epilepsy that is difficult to diagnose, and I was told this is one temporal, temporal lobe epilepsy, and trained, highly trained neurologists and epileptologists cannot make a diagnosis all the time. They will make the diagnosis only 80% of the time. So we try to attack this problem. And this is a so-called uh, intractable epilepsy. Cannot be helped uh, by uh, medicine. So by anti-epileptic drugs. So for those who are not familiar with the field, uh, uh, usually, uh, for a epileptic patient, neurologist or epileptologist orders an EEG. So a scalp EEG, non-invasive. You go to the hospital, they place these electrodes uh, uh, in the form like a hat on your head, and they record 19 locations. These locations are noted here, but I want you to pay attention to just one of them, T3. So for temporal low epilepsy. We only look at the record of this location, T3, and the rest are defined like this based on anatomy of the brain. So the T3 electrodes, the T3 electrodes that are used for temporal lobe epilepsy diagnosis, I'm going to talk for a few minutes. So EEG is very high, non invasive, it's non invasive, so it's a good modality for using the diagnosis. And it's expensive. So what are the clinical goals? Seizure detection and epilepsy diagnosis. 
So in celiac detection is easier. There is something to be seen. But the epilepsy diagnosis is not easy. Because uh, unless you catch the patient during seizure, it's not easy to make the diagnosis. So that's a more challenging.
fifth dimension and the sixth dimension and the fifth dimension. No, we are not able. Human being is not able to visualize higher dimensions. Just because we cannot visualize higher dimensions, it doesn't mean they don't exist. To tell us to helps us to see higher dimensions. That's the idea. We're using the chaos theory. Here you see a, an EEG electroencephalogram uh, in 3D. There's no, nothing to see. There's nothing interesting to see. There's nothing interesting to see. So in order to see something interesting in EEG, we have to go to the fifth to thirteenth dimension. If you go to fifth to thirteenth dimension, then you can differentiate a temporal lobe epilepsy case from a healthy case. That is the gist of it. So, we develop first a wavelength chaos methodology. So, one thing we do, we look at EEG subbands. <coughs> Neurologists, they look at the entire EEG. They look at the entire EEG and then they, uh, on that basis, they try to detect seizure or make a diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, our theory is that is not sufficient. We have to look at subbands. What are subbands? We will see them in the next slide. So, the primary focus of the methodology is to map each EEG database to a point on the n dimensional feature space using the chaos theory. And that will uh, increase the classification accuracy. Without doing that, uh, you are not going to achieve high accuracy. So, I don't want to show you too many equations and spoil your morning, just a few to give you the gist of what is involved. So, you know, this is uh, the preliminary chaos analysis. So we have to create a phase space. So we have an EEG signal, which is a time series vector, and then we have to deal with the concept of optimum lag and minimum invariant dimensions. We have to find the right dimension. If dimension, I show dimension three for EEG, there's nothing to see. And if dimension is too high also, you don't see anything. So we have to find the right dimension. And for use for this, we use, for example, methods like cost method to find the minimum in dimension, and then we reconstruct the time delay vector. And measures of chaos. In this particular epilepsy diagnosis, we use two measures. One is called coordination dimension, which is a measure of complexity of the system, and the other one is called the largest scale of the We have a well-known Russian mathematician. So you came up with this, and it's a measure of chaoticity with trajectory divergence. And this is going to cause a fly effect. You know, weather system, whether they cannot predict weather more than a week in advance. You know why? Because a small change of weather in China will affect the change of the weather here in Elsie. It's small. It's called, that is known as butterfly effect. So, so weather system is a chaotic system. So then we perform final chaos analysis. So again, these stand for a relation dimension, largest and more exponent have mathematical definition. I don't want to go into details of those. So our research ideology is to investigate differences in the nonlinear dynamics of epilepsy and seizures in EEG. And we challenge the common assumption that EEG should be treated as a whole. That's what neurologists do. So we look at some band, and we show that we can actually improve uh, markers. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to find mathematical markers. You know, yesterday, uh, Professor Fernandez took me to his lab, and he had a lot of microscope, and he can see things under his microscope. And so we are using similar concept, and here we have a mathematical microscope. So we use chaos theory as a mathematical microscope to find markers. To find markers, that's the idea. So more accurate representation of individual processes in the brain are the goal. So here is the subband. Subband we take the original EEG on the top, you see, and then we perform a low pass here filter and then band limit the EEG because less than zero to sixty hertz. About that is not of significance. And then we perform wavelength analysis to find these various subbands delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. So these are not my, my division, these are 
determined by physiologists and, and neuroscientists and neurologists, they have physiological meaning. For example, delta is a slow wave, and uh, if you're awake, and you shouldn't have any delta wave. If you have delta wave, and, and that indicates pathology. And theta, theta wave, theta here, you see theta in infant and children. If you're drowsy, you can have some theta, otherwise, if something is wrong with your brain, you need to have your brain examined, and etc. And then, like gamma, and neurologists and neuroscientists believe that gamma has no significance, biological significance, and our research shows otherwise. We can use gamma to differentiate between uh, different kinds of epilepsies. So, here is an example of top bands. On the top, you see the entire band, EEG band, and here you see delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. But the scale is not the, the same. The scale here is different. So, so you see this is high frequency, this is the lowest frequency. Delta is lowest frequency, gamma is highest frequency. So the next step is finding the right features so you can make the diagnosis correctly. So if you, if you just perform a statistical analysis, you're not going to get accurate results. The problem is too complicated. It's not amenable to a statistical analysis. So we need to test potential feature spaces using different classifiers. So our parameter, I already mentioned, EEG complexity, total correlation dimension, and the EEG characteristic using larger CFNO exponent, but we also use a standard deviation as a measure of EEG value. So for every EEG record, we have now six. One original EEG and one sub six, six sigma. So we have a large uh, space of features because uh, parameters, total parameters are six times three because three means uh, seizure and uh, ictal, interictal and healthy, so three times six is 18. And number of possible features become two to the power 18, like 230,000 features. So we have to look for the right feature, right marker, in order to be able to distinguish uh, among the three classes, excellent, excellent, healthy. And for this, we, the PhD student, spent uh, months of parametric study. This is like a student uh, looking at samples under microscope. And this was done in two steps, band specific analysis, select promising parameters, select promising classifier, and then mixed band analysis. So here I just want to show you some, some results here. So the result here is in the box down here, down here. So we discover nine markers, and the prefix alpha refers to the subband. So there's no prefix that is the entire band, it's alpha subband, beta subband, and gamma subband. So you see, we, we discovered nine features in that red box, and including gamma subband. So the gamma that neurologists and neuroscientists believe that. Uh, will not uh, determine anything in terms of pathology, we found that they are helpful in terms of uh, making the diagnosis. And then, first for the classifier, we use the seven word marker back to the patient network and then try to improve upon it. So, here is some of your results. You can see the accuracy can vary widely depending on what you do and what uh, features you use and what classifier you use. So this is k-means, accuracy is less than 60%. And here is two different type of linear discriminant analysis. These are uh, from the statistics theory. But if you go to the very right end, if you use a mixed span of our nine features and use the uh, Levenberg markov propagation of network, you can use accuracy of 97%. So that is from here. And after that, we try to improve this accuracy even further. So we develop a cosine label basis function on our network. And we improve the accuracy to 98%. Then we started developing a totally new neural network. Totally new neural network. And so the idea was to advance the biological realism of neural networks. So we develop a new multiple spiking neural network model and also the corresponding linear algorithm, then we apply that to epilepsy and seizure detection. So this can be a subject 
a completely different subject. I just want to mention a couple of things about this. This is what I call this third generation neural network. And known as a spike in neural network, and biologically it is more realistic. And we know that uh, spikes, we have a, a train of spikes in the brain. So neurons that don't work in isolation. So they communicate via, via spikes. So the idea is to have greater accuracy and efficiency also solving more complicated problems. So we have this uh, spike in our network. So how do neurons communicate? A neuron communicate with other neurons through the generation of action potential or spikes. A neuron generates a spike when its internal state as determined by its membrane potential reaches some threshold. Connections with the neurons are made at synaptic terminal. As such a site, the output spike of a presynaptic neuron triggers the release of a neurotransmitter, which in turn mediates a change in the membrane potential of the target postsynaptic neurons. And this change in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron can be described by the postsynaptic potential and may be negative for inhibitory impulse or excitatory. So you see that. The commonly used neural network is a gross approximation of real neurons in the brain. So in the brain we have a, 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 a sort of a spike of uh, neurons. So these neurons come at one after each other and that's how the brain is set up to work. So the so internal state of a neuron is actually more complicated than uh, what a, a standard neuron Represent. So here you see we have the, the uh, idea of repolarization. Okay. So for uh, this is action, action potential. And then, and then we have that hyperpolarization on the right where uh, it goes actually below the rest in potential. So we try to model this. This is the way an actual neuron works. Okay, let's see. It. So here in our spike neural network architecture, so on the left you see a standard architecture. However, there's a two nodes, look here on the right corner, right bottom corner, right here, right here. It's the one neuron, one neuron. And the connection is through multiple lines and we have spikes. This is spike, another spike, another spike. So we have a train of the spikes. And that makes the situation more complicated. So we have modeled this, and I don't want to go into detail about that. The idea is more realism and more accurate representation of neurons. So if you're interested, you can read the detail into this book, Automated EG Based Diagnosis and Neurological Disorders, Inventing the Future of Neurology. And this was uh, published in 2010, and the future hasn't arrived yet. And by the way, this book is in collaboration with Nahi Kalmi, a new neurologist. So she has read everything and make sure that whatever we did is correct. So, as I said, the idea was to work on the Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, I forgot to mention, for epilepsy, we have plenty of data. Plenty of data are available. So we use a database of 300 EEGs, 100 healthy, 100 interactive, and 100 extra. That's a large database. But if you go to other disorders like Alzheimer's, there is very little data available. So now that like recently, maybe last few years, more and more data are coming available. So we work on Alzheimer's disease next. And you can see that this is a very common problem and the number of patients is increasing every year because we are living a longer life and uh, the diagnosis, early diagnosis is not possible. It's virtually impossible right now. So there are different groups They're trying to find methods for early diagnosis, and I'm looking at EEGs, other groups are looking at MRI or other imaging techniques. So my goal is look at EEGs. So here you see uh, the latest stage, but latest stage diagnosis doesn't help. If you do earlier stage, then there is medicine that can uh, uh, delay the progression of Alzheimer's disease. That's the idea. To make the diagnosis early, so use medicines to delay 
the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know how the diagnosis is made? By very simple tests. Neurologists use very simple tests and to make the diagnosis, it is mostly qualitative. To give you one example, just one example, and neurologists will ask you if you're a potential Alzheimer's patient, will ask you to roll uh, a three o'clock. Draw a circle and show three o'clock. Are you able to do it? An Alzheimer's patient cannot do that. So this is an example of tests that neurologists use in order to make a diagnosis. We are trying to change that. We are trying to revolutionize the practice of neurology. So why EEG? And uh, EEG offer a powerful alternative uh, compared with imaging with high spatial and temporal resolution to glean insight into brain's cortical connectivity and brain dynamics. So we are interested in uh, having insight in brain's cortical connectivity and brain dynamics. So we develop a fractality and a wavelength chaos on lesser methodology for diagnosis of AD. So for fractality dimension, we use two different concepts. One is called CATS fractality, the other one Higuchi fractality. Katz and Higuchi are mathematicians, and they define fractality. So the idea is to find most discriminating FD fractal dimension and the corresponding loci and EEG subbands for discriminating between AD and healthy EEGs using ANOVA, a statistical test. So let me explain to you. This is much more difficult than epilepsy, because for temporal epilepsy, we look only at T3 uh, sensor. T3 electrode, if you remember. But for Alzheimer's, we have to look at the entire 19 electrodes. So, this is the strategy. So, again, fractality dimension is a mathematical concept. I want to give you some, using some simple picture to give you the gist of what, why we are using the fractality here. What is the concept of fractality? This is the leaf. You see the repetition of pattern, right? So you see this repetition of pattern, and that is called fractality. This is a beautiful fractality, we see fractality in nature. Another example is called cock, a snowflake fractality. So, so actually the snowflake is not from here, so this repetition of this pattern is the snowflake. And this is fractality in three dimensions. And so far you like this fractality, right? How about this one? Do you want to have a trial like that? No. This is also fractality. Undesirable fractality. We use this concept in the brain. We are trying to find whether we have something like this in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. So that's the idea of using fractality. Fractality is a concept from chaos theory and neurolinear science. So I gave you the gist of it, but these guys have mathematical definition. So the goal is not to define every term here, so, but at least you should know that they have mathematical definitions. So, a few words about the data set, we have limited data. So, for epilepsy, we have high accuracy and we have high confidence in our results. But here, our data is limited, and uh, I was talking to Professor Fernandez, he's collecting some data, I hope we can get this data and do some collaboration with him. But based on the data that we have here, and you can see, and we, I'm going to show some results. We have written several papers on this, but I'm going to show you some results. Incidentally, incidentally if one of you interested in this research, you can send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the papers we have written. So here is just some results here to show you that I'm running out of time here. And uh, here you see just the result. The low side, you know the low side, with discriminating KFPs. The only tax uh, fractality dimension was able to differentiate between healthy and Alzheimer's disease. And also, only in the beta subband, we were able to see differences. Only in the beta subband. So, here you see the, both for eyes closed and eyes open. And on the right, lower right, you see some accuracy results. Accuracy goes from 94% to 99%. But again, this is based on limited data. Next, 
We work on a different disorder. This is more of a psychiatric disorder rather than a neurology disorder. You know, for all different diseases, you have to go to see a different doctor. For example, for epilepsy, you go to an epileptologist. For Alzheimer's disease, you go to a cognitive neurologist. And for ADHD, you go to a child psychiatrist. So we develop a wavelet synchronization methodology for EEG-based diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactive disorder. A lot of children have that. Most, you know, your child, your child maybe is misbehaving. You are very upset. Perhaps he has ADHD. He has to be treated. Maybe he's not doing well at his school. So diagnosis at earlier stage is very important. So here we use. So again, this is a very prevalent disease here. And five to ten percent of all children in the world have ADHD. And often misdiagnosed. You just say, my child misbehaves. Maybe you will punish him. Okay. So we develop a model for diagnosis of ADHD. And again, how is the diagnosis done? You go to a child psychiatrist, and the child psychiatrist gives you a questionnaire, you ask some questions, and you decide you have ADHD. There is no uh, objective way of making diagnosis. And we are trying to change that. So before this research, there was no prior research on the changes of non-linear features of EEG in ADHD. So for that research, and here how is our data set, and I had a collaborator who had access to this database. Personally, I'm a computation monitor, I don't collect data myself. So but I have collaborators, so this collaborator collected data. And on that basis, we developed this model. And here we use a different concept called synchronization concept. Uh, may I know how much time do I have left? The chair of the committee? Sorry. Maybe 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Okay. So then I have to go fast here. So here we use a different concept called uh, synchronization concept. And uh, synchronization is known in neuroscience. And the idea is to detect inter interdependency among variables of a system. Brain is a highly complex system consisting of couple subsystems with high connectivity among the large numbers of neurons. And there are two kinds of the different kinds of synchronization system concept. And nonlinear synchronization methods can be defined into phase synchronization, where synchrony of phases of two systems is calculated. And the other one is generalized synchronization, where similarity of the state stage trajectories of two or more systems is computed, and the latter is what we use. And so we use a concept called synchronization likelihood. It's a global criteria quantifying the nonlinear similarities and interdependencies among activities of different neuronal colonies manifested and localized by the EG protocol. So we postulate. We postulate that neural network connectivity deficits may discriminate ADHD patients in certain low side and sub band. And here we use, as I said, a synchronization like you as a mathematical definition. So I'm going to skip that and I'm going to show some results. And the result at the bottom you see, uh, we can have an accuracy of 95% plus minus 25% uh, to, to diagnose that ADHD. Next, we went to autism. Next, we went to autism. And that's another disorder. And actually, it is called the autism spectrum disorder. The two different diseases, the cluster of autism spectrum disorder. So it's a behavior, cognitive, and brain development disorder. And characteristics are impairment in social interaction, communication, and restricted and repetitive behavior. So here is uh, some material from the Society for Neuroscience. Brief brain breaking. What I want to show you is the bottom. Key to helping these children is the early detection of their autism. Usually that is not done. The diagnosis is made years after a person has the autism. Once Confirmed several methods may be employed to treat and control the disorder. So we are trying to make the early diagnosis of ADHD in an uh, objective way. 
So we developed again a fractal thing and a wavelength chaos from that of mentality for each base psychological autism spectrum disorder. Here we have limited data. All data is limited, only eight healthy and nine KSP patients. And uh, so result, I'm going to show you some results. Here we have to look at the entire uh, brain electrodes and we achieve an accuracy of 90%. We have also done some work on alcoholism. I'm very close to my lecture, so I'm not going to go into details, just some uh, brief comments here. How do you diagnose alcoholism? Have you thought about it? Go to a, alcoholism is a disease, not just you drink. Somebody who is dependent on alcohol and is special to make a diagnosis. So we are, we believe that using EEGs, you can make the diagnosis of alcohol. We are looking at the patient student working on the diagnosing psychopath. So, the spotting psychopath using, actually for that particular patient student, we are using different technologies, not only EMG, but we are using different, we are using fMRI, MRI, etc. So we can, uh, we are able to uh, determine psychopath. So this has a lot of implications, social and ethical implications. Before you release someone from prison, maybe you should have an EEG on him. And if he is still a psychopath, you have to put him in jail somewhere, maybe. So there are some ethical questions here. We are also looking at the schizophrenia. So we are able to... Schizophrenia is very difficult to diagnose. It's not easy. Very difficult to diagnose, only with the later stage, at earlier stage, very difficult to diagnose. So we are looking to diagnose the schizophrenia uh, using EEG. So we are towards a unified theory of brain for diagnosis of neurological and psychiatric disorders. So we are moving towards the following paradigm. You want to take one EEG test and you will be uh, determine whether you have any kind of psychiatric or neurological disorder, whether it is schizophrenic and whether it is Alzheimer's or anything else. And by the way, EEG is not used in a clinical setting. It's used primarily for epilepsy only because by looking at EEGs only for epilepsy, you can see you can see seizure and possibly epilepsy. And this is my last slide here, maybe. I have a couple more slides. So maybe I'll stop here and take some questions and uh, go from here. We are currently, I'm also looking at a project uh, to be able to read your mind. I want to put uh, electrodes on your head and be able to watch your thinking. That is one of my current projects. What are you thinking right now? What are you thinking? I want to read it, read your brain, and I think we can do it. Are you thinking something bad, something vicious, something nice? We can read it. That can be done. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we have you done. Hello, and this is a very nice uh, presentation. I want to ask you about uh, if you are using EEG, um, what happens if you use an EEG which has a very uh, good resolution? Uh, it's going to change uh, the data which you have. So, for example, if you are analyzing the cow, so the you're going to have more data to, yeah. to... Yeah, actually, we have also used, most of my work is on EEGs because data, availability of data. We have used MEG for diagnosis of MCI, mild cognitive impairment, which is pre-Alzheimer's. So we have done research using MEG for uh, a diagnosis of MCI, and mild cognitive impairment. 
So MEG is only a research tool, research tool. Neurologists don't use MEG, they cannot read MEG. But uh, yes, we are looking at MEG too. And not only that, uh, we have to go to, toward multimodal diagnosis. So, in other words, uh, uh, Professor Fernandez was telling me that he has data, MRI data, and also MG data for the same patient, Alzheimer patients. So, to make the, the diagnosis most accurately, we have to have a multi-model diagnosis, so we can use EEG, MEG, and MRI. So that's the direction. But the challenge is to have data for patients, from patients, for all these modalities. Did I answer your question, or do you have a follow-up question? So MEG is another way of making a diagnosis. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You mean that you have um, uh, 16 or 32 electrons? Yes. Um, but for example, in MEG, you have uh, 200, 230, 250. So, I mean, the, the precision uh, of the cows, of the um, what you are looking, could be different. Your parameter. The general approach will be the same, but the, your primary study will be more sensitive. It will be computationally more intensive, but the, the general approach will work. So, you know, there's a common theme. You know, we have written over the last 13 years more than 35 papers. But there's an overarching theme. The theme here is. Uh, you have to have a multi paradigm approach. You're using only wavelength, you're using one length for it's not enough. So, we have a general, you know, I've started this multi paradigm approach, and now a lot of people are following me. So, the same approach should work. But you have to modify it, you have to tweak it. So, it will be computationally more intensive. Yes. So, MEG data is less available, but the general approach will work. And as I said, we have done at least for MCI, all high cognitive impairment. So, we have, we have a paper on that. One more question. Thank you very much to Hazel and Tammy. The robot is safe. The robot is safe. Oh, the robot, okay. I wanted to put two more slides if I can. can I show you? Yeah, yeah. Let me see what happened here. How long did I speak? Okay. I can go to the next slide. So let's go to the next slide. I just want to see what I'm doing right like, now. Is it blocked? Kind of lost your system engineering in here. Uh, the two slides are actually about brain computer interface. I just want to mention one more thing I'm right now. Okay, this is, and can you go to the, let's see. So, you know, right now we are, the next step is to develop brain computer interfaces. So the idea is that I mentioned I'm interested, interested in building a brain, and that has other implications. So there are uh, patients, like a stroke patients, and we cannot move their arm. So we are studying to read the, the brain. And on that basis, uh, we have communicated a communication with some people with our medical person. And right now, for example, I'm working with another fellow who is a physical therapist. And he has two monkeys. He has two, he has two monkeys. 
and we are collecting data of movement monkeys. So we are trying to see when the monkey moves his left hand or right hand, what kind of signals we can get uh, from the brain. And here we are getting EMG signals. This is based on EMG signals. So and this is this paper shows preliminary results, and I did. I showed this paper because the results are very preliminary, but that's the direction we are taking. So we are trying to read the brain and communicate uh, by, by the computer to reading the brain signals. So, thank you. Excuse me, Professor. Uh, you were talking about uh, neural networks. So my question was, uh, how do you train them or do you use the information and provide from the EIG to train the neural networks in order to work to help you to, I guess, to visualize the, the problem. How do we train? The question is how do we train? Exactly. Okay, very good. That's why I show the database for each, for each, uh, this is, I show you database, you remember? You know, we have, uh, like for example, uh, for epilepsy, we have 300 data sets. Uh, 100 LC, 100 ICTL, 100 interactive. So what we do, we take, for example, we use 90% of the data to train the system, and then we use 10% to test the system, and we choose them randomly 100 times. The 90% is chosen randomly out of the 100%. So all of these require training. So that's why we need data. We need data from real patients. So we use real data and divide into training set and testing set. And that's how we can measure the accuracy of the system. Did I answer your question? Yes? Okay, thank you. So let's move to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you.